So on October 27, 1998, the United States Congress passed a statute in honor of this actor, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act. This statute extended the term of existing and future copyrights by 20 years. When it was introduced by Sonny Bono's wife, Mary Bono, she said this on the floor of the United States House. Actually, Sonny wanted the term of copyright protection to last forever. I am informed by staff that such a change would violate the Constitution. As you know, there is also Jack Valenti's proposal for a term to last forever, less one day. Perhaps the committee may look at that next Congress. Now, in a very strange, weird way, it's because of that statute that you are here today. Because because of that statute, a man named Eric Eldred, a web publisher from New Hampshire, decided that he was going to engage in an act of civil disobedience. Eldred had a career of making available public domain works as they passed into the public domain, and he was not going to sit by idly as Congress put off his project for another 20 years. So as the New York Times online edition reported, he was going to start a project to make this work available despite the copyright, civil disobedience. When I read about Eric Eldred's act of civil disobedience, I was a little puzzled about why Congress was doing what it was doing. And I wondered whether what Congress was doing was actually authorized by the Constitution, the idea of extending the term of an existing copyright. So I looked at the text of the Constitution, which looks something like this. It says, Congress has the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. It was clear this constitutional text was outlining a means to a particular end. The means were to grant authors and inventors a certain monopoly power. The end was to promote progress. And so the question that the uh, Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act raised was whether a power to grant exclusive rights for limited terms could actually make sense for works that were already existing. How could granting more protection actually promote the progress of science. In my view, it didn't. It seemed to me that would be unconstitutional. Then I look beyond the text to the history of this particular constitutional provision, and that confirmed this understanding. This provision was drawn from the English experience of a corrupt king who was handing out monopolies to works that already existed. For example, Someone was granted a monopoly to print the Bible. Someone else granted a monopoly to create playing cards. Parliament responded by passing something called the Statute of Monopolies, which limited the power of the king to grant monopolies, and the Statute of Anne, which limited the power to grant monopolies over printing of creative works. The United States took this one step better. We didn't just have a statute limiting these powers. We put it into the Constitution. And in 1790, the framers of our Constitution set out a term for copyright. Its term was 14 years, renewable once, meaning the maximum term was 28 years. This rule stayed like this until 1831, when Congress set up a new term of 28 years initially, which could be renewed for 14 years, meaning a maximum term of 42 years. That rule stayed in effect then all the way to 1909, when Congress changed it again to extend it to 28 years initially, and a renewal for 28 years, meaning 56 years. And that stayed for about 75 years, 
for 65 years until beginning in 1962, Congress began to extend the term of existing copyrights 11 times in 40 years. Some of the time referred to as the Mickey Mouse Protection Acts because when Mickey was about to pass into the public domain magically, his term was extended. In 1976, they changed the term to life plus 50 years and 75 years for older works. And then 1998, Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, the Mickey Mouse Protection Act, extended that for 20 years to a maximum term of 95 years for older works. This practice of continual extending of terms for works that already existed seemed to be inconsistent with this history as well. And then they looked at the policy Copyright is an incentive. Longer copyright terms provide more incentive. But as you get a long, long copyright term, the additional incentive is much smaller. So as economists evaluated it, if you could increase by 1% copyright term 100 years from uh, 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 if you had a 1% chance of increasing your copyright revenue by $100 20 years into the future, but starting 75 years from now, which is what the Sunny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act did, how much economists would say is that worth? Their answer was it was worth about 7 cents. Meaning the value of this increase provided not much incentive. And more importantly, Whatever incentive it created, it only created incentive for works going forward, for new works. No matter what we do, Robert Frost or George Gershwin, we're not going to produce anything else because of the additional copyright protection. You can't increase incentives in the past. So then what sense, what policy sense did this extension of copyright provide? In a new policy sense, its explanation was money, meaning money that campaign contributions reflected by those who had the monopolies, who already had the monopolies to existing works, such as the, frame, the framers were concerned about with the Bible and playing cards. These monopolies were extremely valuable, the monopolies that the Frost estate had, the Gershwin estate had, and the Walt Disney Company had. And these entities were willing to spend up to the value of their monopoly to extend it. So there was no justification in a policy sense, and again, that led us to think it was wrong. But policy and text and history is one thing. Then I thought a little bit about the decency to this. Because as you think about the motivation for this extension, driven as it was largely by the company that bears this man's name, Walt Disney, Think about the fact that Walt Disney's greatest works were works that built on the past. Think about the whole collection of the works that made the Disney estate or Disney Corporation famous. Most of these works were works that had been produced just after a work passed into the public domain or work that had long been in the public domain. In some cases, they waited until a work passed into the public domain before they released it. Even this creature, who of course is the famous birth of Mickey Mouse, Steamboat Willie. Steamboat Willie is released immediately after Buster Keaton released Steamboat Bill, a kind of remix of Steamboat Bill, celebrating the very best of what we could call remix creativity. Disney took from the past, built on the past, to create something new. But after Walt Disney did this, the practice changed for the Disney Corporation. Increasingly, the Disney Corporation was eager in controlling how people built upon Disney, pushing to extend the term of copyright so that no one could do to the Disney Corporation what Walt Disney did to the Brothers of Grimm. Now, text, history, and policy notwithstanding, this just seemed indecent from the perspective of fair treatment of the past. It was wrong. So text, history, policy, and decency added together to make me believe that this act was unconstitutional. I did what any liberal law professor does in the United States. I raised 
to the Supreme Court to get it to declare that this was unconstitutional. And there I am standing before the Supreme Court announcing this idea that this was plainly unconstitutional. And as I thought about this Supreme Court, I was very optimistic about the result. Because five of the members of the Supreme Court are conservatives, originalists. They believe the Constitution should be interpreted as the framers of our Constitution would have interpreted it. And against the framing Constitution, what Congress was doing was just plainly beyond its power. So inconsistent with the framers' meaning meant we would get those five votes. And then I thought about Justice Stevens and Justice Breyer, two very reasonable non-conservative justices who would also plainly oppose this extension. And I recognized we had seven votes for striking this down against two votes against striking it down. And in fact, the vote was seven to two, but not quite the way I expected. The majority was written uh, by Justice Ginsburg, and uh, two critical swing votes here were in dissent, but the five conservatives sat silently as the court upheld a practice of Congress wildly exceeding the power the framers envisioned they would have. It was a total defeat of this objective of using the law to stop this abuse of culture. And after the case was lost, I was asked by a colleague, why did I expect the Supreme Court would ever act against all the money in the world? And the answer was, I wasn't sure. Now, in the middle of this case, Eric Eldred said to us, it's very nice you're taking my case to the Supreme Court, challenging the Sunny Boat on Copyright Term Extension Act on my behalf, but I want something more to come out of this case. I want this case to stand for something more than just whether we win or whether we lose. So at the time we were litigating this case, we started something called Copyrights Commons which was a group of people working together to help us prepare the case of Eldred versus Reno, eventually Eldred versus Ashcroft. And in 1999, that organization launched itself, and then in 2001, Eric Saltzman, current board of Creative Commons, suggested we rename this organization to Creative Commons, and the members of that organization voted unanimously to rename it on January 16th, 2001 two years to the day before the Supreme Court would resolve the case of Eldred versus Ashcroft. Our first executive director, Molly Von Howling, led the organization by building the framework that we would eventually uh, implement. And then in 2002, Glenn Brown and uh, Nehru Paraya worked together to launch this organization on December 16, 2002. One month later, the Supreme Court wiped us out, defeating our claim in Elgin versus Ashcroft. And one hour after the Supreme Court's decision was announced, into my office walked representatives from the William Flora, Flora Hewlett Foundation and handed us a check for $1 million to launch the Creative Commons movement. That's the history that gave birth to this organization called Creative Commons, which in turn gave birth to this organization called the iCommons Movement, which is in turn why this event is happening today. But a decade ago, when we were thinking about why this case was so important, a bunch of us sitting around recognized that there were two extraordinarily important changes that had happened that made this case and this movement necessary. One change was a set of changes in code. Another change was a set of changes in code. One set was a set of changes in code as in technology, digital technology, the internet. Another change was a set of changes in law, the way the architecture of copyright law affected creativity in the context of the internet. So the change in technology is the change all of you recognize through the freedom 
and the creative freedom that this internet has produced. A freedom that comes not from the law, comes from technology. It's not something that's been earned, it was taken. The explosion in digital creativity that this technology encouraged, encouraging many kinds of creative expression, the kind that's most interesting to me is something we can call remix. We've seen this remix in the context of professional creativity, so an example of music that I've told many times about the Beatles um, album called The White Album, which then, of course, inspired Jay-Z to produce the Black Album. That then inspired the next great instance of remix creativity in music, which was DJ Danger Mouse producing the Grey Album literally synthesizing tracks of the White Album and Black Album together to produce something great. That's 2004. Four years later, a band called Girl Talk, it's actually one guy who runs this electronic music band, released an album where in one particular song more than 213 tracks had been remixed. A radical new kind of remix creativity expressing the capacity, the potential of this technology. But not just professionals, amateurs too. There's an explosion of something in the United States called AMVs, anime music videos, of course building upon the anime which get birth here in Japan. Anime music videos are created by people taking this work, this creative work, and re-editing it, setting it to a music soundtrack. So something as trivial as this. Or something as creative as this. You're every breath that I take 
anyone with access to a $1,500 computer who can take the sounds and images from the culture around us and do something with it in a way that expresses ideas powerfully, more powerfully than they could be expressed in simple words. This is remix. It is not piracy. It is writing in the socially, culturally relevant sense for the 21st century. And to be able to engage in this writing is a measure of your literacy in the 21st century, the literacy of a new generation, building a certain kind of culture, what we could call a read-write culture. Now the point to recognize is that this building is possible because of this architecture of code, an architecture of the technology of the digital internet. That's one change. The second change we saw more than a decade ago was the change in the way law would interact with this creativity. Because if copyright regulates something called copies, in a digital context, every single use of creative work produces a copy. Such every single use was presumptively regulated, meaning there was an expansion in control over culture that was massive relative to anything we had ever seen in the history of free culture. And this, because of the architecture of copyright law, a technical, accidental architecture of copyright law that triggers the regulation of copyright on the production of a copy. Now these two changes, together, produced the drive for a war. You might say, in the United States, yet another war. We fight many wars, but the one I'm talking about here is the copyright wars, wars which my friend Jack Valenti, the late Jack Valenti, used to refer to as his own, quote, terrorist war, where apparently the terrorists in this war are our children. This war was a drive to strengthen legal and technical control over how culture gets used through new laws, new penalties, to wage this war on use of culture without the control. Because of the architecture of copyright law, this was the objective of the war. These two changes, two different architectures, one an architecture of technology, second an architecture of law, came together to produce what we call in the United States a perfect storm. This was a perfect storm for culture. Just as technology was increasing the freedom that people had to remix and share their culture, the law was increasing the control over the ability of people to remix and share their culture. And this war drove rage on both sides of this battle, and a kind of extremism was the result, a generation of kids who were referred to as criminals and a self-righteous industry that used the criminal law to affect this control. A Creative Commons was born in response to this perfect storm of culture. It was intended as a grassroots movement of creators, otherwise known as copyright who would look at this default of all rights reserved and say that they don't need all rights, the most they need is some rights, 
spreading and understanding through their actions of the importance of balance in the context of cultural regulation. Not supporting stealing, but supporting authors freely freeing the part of the rights granted to them by the law they don't need. So they say through their acts, here's what we need, here are the protections we need, here's all we need, the rest we set free. And in the five plus years since we launched this, this movement has exploded in the number of works that have been protected through this balanced form of copyright. And a steady progress has been recognized in this understanding and support for this movement of balance. But the most important part of this movement is its global part. It's the part you represent. A global commons, a G commons, an I commons, you, who come together to celebrate this opportunity of technology and the law to work together to facilitate the potential of this technology. And the part of the I commons movement that's the creative commons movement comes together to celebrate the explosion of countries around the world, now 47, that have carried these terms of freedom to their own context of law, expressing an increasing global norm of expression, expression that is to be balanced in the context of this regulation. Not because the movement is against copyright, and by recognizing copyright, not because the movement is against freedom, but because the movement is against the extremism that defines the current reality of this regulation, against a certain kind of insanity. The insanity that thinks that the only choice here is a choice between all rights reserved or no rights respected, an extremism that defines this debate, an insanity that increasingly constitutes especially the debate in the United States. Now, so you know I'm a law professor, this insanity is increasingly my life as I produce lawyers who go out to fight this war. I'm going to tell you about a story that happened in one particular instance of this fight about this form of regulation that happened here at the Association of the Bar of the City of New York. I was asked to come talk in the context of a panel discussion that was held in this room, beautiful room with these velvet curtains and red carpet. The room was packed with artists and creators and some lawyers who had come eager to learn about how they could create using these digital technologies consistent with the law of fair use. Now if you know anything about American law of fair use, you know fair use has four separate factors. And so the organizers of this event thought they were very efficiently allocate 15 minutes to each of those factors by asking one lawyer to speak on each factor for 15 minutes so that by the end of that hour, the audience would understand fair use law perfectly and they could go out and create consistent with the law of copyright. Well, about halfway through this conversation, I looked out in the audience and the reaction was actually something much more like this as people increasingly recognized they were never going to understand how this law applied to their own creative work. And so I went into a stage of daydreaming, I am daydreaming, about what this room reminded me of. I knew somewhere in the back of my head I was getting an association, and I recognized the association came from a passion I had in the beginning of my life to study, because I was critical of, entities like this one. And that's what the room <coughs> reminded me of. And I began to wonder, what is it in the history of the Soviet Union when you could have convinced members of the Politburo that their system was insane? I mean, 76 was too early. Things were pretty much working. 1989 is too late. Everybody would have understood it by then. So when was it between 1976 and 1989 
when you could have convinced someone that the system had just become insane? And what could you have said to them then? To convince them that this idea that they romantically followed into their career had crashed and burned because it had become insane for this world. Because as I spend my time as a lawyer and a law professor listening to the lawyers around me who tell us, or at least us in the United States, that they insist that nothing has changed, the same rules apply, it's the pirates who are the deviants. Well, you might be right about that. But insisting that the system can go forward without any change, I realize it is we, or they, who are insane. That the existing system of copyright could never work for this form of creative expression. Either we will have to force people to stop creating, or we will get a revolution that will wipe away the law of copyright. In my view, both options are not acceptable. We need to recognize that both options are increasingly plausible, and that this insanity is encouraging a movement which there are some in this room who participate in, a kind of copyright abolitionist movement. People who believe the world doesn't need copyright anymore. I am not a copyright abolitionist. I do not believe in that movement. I believe copyright continues to be an essential part of extremely important forms of creativity, at least a copyright regime properly balanced and limited. And my view is we need to recognize the threat from this abolitionist movement and fight it. So in that sense, you could say, I am not Gore, uh, Yeltsin in this movement. I'm more like Gorbachev, the old communist, trying to preserve the old system in this new age, because I still believe that this system of copyright can make sense in this new age, to preserve copyright. That's my objective against these two extremes, extremes which, in my view, would destroy power. Now, Creative Commons, whether you accept this limited version or not, was born to attempt the effort at calming this storm, to enable the promise of this technology, even if in enabling the promise of this technology, we need to rally a movement of artists and creators and writers and scholars and teachers and parents against all the money in the world. Thank you very much.